Hi, I'm Larry Castle here with Ken Brown for That's a Good Question, episode 78, How Do I Know I'm a Christian? Welcome to this week's episode of That's a Good Question. We cover a wide range of topics on our podcast. We talk about political topics, cultural themes, uh, and also, uh, uh, of course, subjects that are related directly to our work right. as pastors. Um, we talk about how the church should function, philosophy of ministry, discipleship, church growth, all those kind of things. Right. But our favorite among these biblical matters is a review of the gospel itself. Mm, yes. And that's because it's central to everything we do. So today, we're going to rehearse the gospel message. Mm. And uh, we're going to also address the question that plagues many people uh, who may, uh, for various reasons, doubt their relationship with right. God. Right. And that cre- that question is, how do I know I'm a Christian? Mm-hmm. So Pastor Ken, why don't you start off by uh, ensuring that all of our uh, viewers understand the gospel. What is the gospel? And then we could talk about how we as individuals can know that we've believed the gospel, right. that we belong to Christ, and how he or she listening to us today can know they're a Christian. Well, one thing that uh, I like to do when a matter has a number of aspects to it is to first simplify Mm -hmm. the matter to its essentials, uh, a kind of summary before you get into the details. It's a chance to step back, see the forest before you start describing all the individual trees. You know that sometimes I do this when I send a note to our congregation. Mm. It has, if it has a lot to it, then I'll often first summarize the issue. And then at you mean uh, there's something after that executive uh, summary You've never section? gotten past the summary. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really a really good practice. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so I give a summary first and then the bottom line at the beginning, but then I'll offer the details after that. And I find that that does help people avoid getting lost in the weeds of terminology mm-hmm. and definitions. Mm-hmm. But then we can break it down to its parts and take a deeper dive. So I think maybe doing that with this would, would be a good idea as well. Yeah. So here's here's a summary. The, the word gospel means good news, and it's good news, though, as seen against the bad news. Mm. The bad news that we are all estranged from God because we have sinned against Him, and without His intervention, then we will remain apart from Him forever in hell. Mm. So the good news starts with the bad news that we've all sinned against God, and God's judgment against us is separation from Him forever in a place of punishment called hell. Now, the good news begins, though, this way, that uh, God the judge is also God the gracious one, and he's provided a way to restore a relationship with himself by God himself coming to earth, doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So God the Son, Jesus Christ, came to earth as man to pay the penalty of our sins so we don't have to pay it forever in hell. Mm -hmm. He did that when he suffered and he died on the cross. And that death on the cross was preceded by a perfect life of righteousness. He not only never did anything wrong, everything he thought, everything he said, everything he did was was right. So that his death on the cross then, after a life like that, was a perfect sacrifice for Mm -hmm. sin. And the benefit of both his life and his death are his gift to us when we give our lives to him. Jesus lived the life that we're supposed to, we were supposed to live. He died the death that we deserve. And if you see your need for what Christ did for you, then you can receive the gift of eternal life mm-hmm. actually right now mm-hmm. by confessing that you're a sinner who needs forgiveness that only Jesus can give and that you will follow him from this moment forward. And if you do that, then I would urge you, dear listener, uh, viewer, to maybe write to us, and we can then help you find a church. If you're outside our area, we'll help you find a church where you can learn of the Lord and learn how to please Him in your your new life. Uh, And if you're in our area, of course, we invite you to to be with us, and that's the business that we're in, helping people do that. So that's a summary of what it means to become a Christian. Now, we have an even shorter summary 
on our church's website. If you go to cbctrenton.com and you go to uh, the uh, About CBC tab mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. top, then there's a, a list of things. One of those is called The Bridge, and The Bridge gives a, a very simple presentation of the gospel. Yeah, yeah, great great overview, Very uh, all the important details. And then that bridge is a great tool. I'll link to that in the okay. show description below Good. this video. Good. So th- you've summarized the central message of Christianity, and it's... Uh, it's a way that our listeners, as well, hmm. um, that tool and your summary you just provided, yeah. that you know, you who are Christians at home, you could use that as kind of an outline, mm-hmm. as a way to mm-hmm. present the gospel to friends and family. And uh, you can also point folks to that tool that we've got on our website right. uh, that Pastor Ken mentioned earlier. So that summary has a lot of detail <laughs> that supports it. Right. You, it was it, that was pretty thorough, but there's a ton of detail that right. supports it, described uh, by terms uh, that you would hear or you'd read in the Bible if you're reading through right. the Bible, right. things you would hear if you attend our church. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's talk about some of those terms that the Bible uses and see how they relate to what you just said. Um, you, you started with the bad news that we are estranged from God, and that means that the message, you know, the way you describe it, the message really starts not with us, but with God. Right. And the reason that sin is so serious is because God is holy. Mm-hmm. And if God were not holy, then sin wouldn't be a big deal, right? right? right. Uh, but his character is holy. And that's an important aspect, uh, or there, there's a very important aspect of that holiness uh, is that he's absolutely morally pure. Mm-hmm. And he made us to reflect his character. So that's why sin is so heinous. It's an offense against God that deserves eternal punishment. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said. You're right. When you talk about sin, sin only has meaning when it's considered in contrast mm-hmm. to God's holy character. So we don't, you know, when we start by saying you're a sinner, well, that then raises the question, what... Uh, Sinner says who? Says who? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. says God, and against as we you described against God's holy character when compared. So we come into the world with a spiritual defect that's inherited from our parents, who got it from their parents. And if you go all the way back, it goes back to the first parents of the human race in sinning against God. And this is not just a slip up. Uh, on the part of the human race, but rather defiance of God's moral order. And it's a distortion of his design for his creatures, humanity made in God's image. Now, that idea of us being made in God's image means that we're, we're to reflect him, back to him, in the way that we think, in the way we talk, in the way we act. Sin means that we refuse to be what God made us to be, and we insist on being what we want to be. Yeah, so we could we could say that... Sin is a failure to display the character of God, Mm -hmm. uh, the way God is, that which God is, Mm -hmm. which is what we were made to do, reflect His image. So so that's why the Bible says, for example, in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Our sin is our failure to reflect God's character, His glory in the way we think and we talk and we act, right? Exactly. And that's a, a serious enough indictment of us as sinners But it's actually even worse than that, because Mm -hmm. sin is not only in what we do that we're not supposed to, but it's also in what we fail to do that we are supposed to. Mm -hmm. That is, we sin by commission, the things we commit, commission, but also the things we omit, omission. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says, James 4, 17, to the one who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. Mm. Well, if, if sin is found not only in our deeds, but our words Mm. and our thoughts, and not only in the things we think and say, but also in the things we fail to think (laughs) and say and do, then we have no way uh, to know even the ways that we sin, all all the ways ways that we sin. We can't can't really keep track of all the ways we sin, much less pay for them Mm. ourselves. And the offense is against an infinitely holy God, like we were saying earlier. So it's an infinite offense that requires an eternal payment, Mm -hmm. and that's what you described there, hell. Uh, That's what the Bible describes, the eternal punishment for our sin. Right. So that means that we ourselves can do nothing to atone, that's Uh, the biblical term, for our sin. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, people get the gospel wrong because they first get sin wrong. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. If, if, we, if we have the wrong understanding of sin, then we're going to have a diminished view of God's grace in the gospel and the yeah. necessity of that grace. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you've listened to us for any length of time, uh, listeners, you know that my background was Pentecostal. I grew up Pentecostal. My Pentecostal church believed that you could lose your salvation so that you come to Christ, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, but after, and, that, and that covers your past sin. But in terms of your future sin, we'll see. Mm-hmm. And it really is up to you to keep saved, to remain saved. You can lose your salvation if you don't get it right. Well, that tormented yeah. me as a teenager. I was going to say, that's, that's terrifying. It is terrifying. It was terrifying for me. And, and I grappled with that as in elementary school. I grappled with it in my high school years. And uh, as I got a little older, was able to read the Bible more on my own, understand it a little more. I went to my Pentecostal pastor, mm-hmm. and I shared with him these concerns I had that, you know, I think the Bible's teaching something different than what I've caught in my, my upbringing. Mm-hmm. And that is that if it's up to me to keep it, then I'm in a world of hurt yeah. <laughs> because I sin so much, and we sin, as we've said here, in ways that we can't even calculate, right? right, right. So I say this to him. And I think I, you've heard me say this, I think, mm-hmm. before, but you know, I will never... This, this line, I'll never forget, is overused <laughs> a lot of times. So I think people th- just throw it in there to be, this was a big deal. But mm-hmm. I literally mean it when I say, I will never forget, sitting across his desk and him saying to me, I have not sinned a willful sin in 35 years. Hmm. And I was just shocked. Just absolutely shocked to hear that. Now, what he did there was he redefined sin Mm -hmm. downward, Mm -hmm. right? He diminished, he minimized sin Mm -hmm. so that it's only commission. It's only what you commit. It's only what you do, not the Mm -hmm. things you omit. Mm -hmm. And then with that false understanding that most people, in fact, have, Mm -hmm. then we don't need God to come and pay. What we really need is a list of rules, and you then either keep it or you don't. Uh, If indeed you have the ability to avoid sin for 35 years or more, like he claimed, well, then why doesn't God just do that and say, have at it? And I I think that is the way many people think about it. Think about how many times people believe that whether you go to heaven or hell is going to be God's going to weigh your good and your bad and see if you had more good than bad, and then he's going to let you in. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about there. But the Bible says in Galatians 3.21, if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. Mm -hmm. Now, I I quoted that fairly quickly, but if a law could have been given that could impart life, now it says a law, meaning just any law, any list of rules, if Mm -hmm. there was one, Mm -hmm. theoretically, uh, that could impart life, then it certainly would have come by, and then it says, the law. Yeah. The law that we're familiar with, the one that's given in the Bible, the, the law that God gave to Moses. I mean, who's going to improve on God's given list of rules? Nobody is. Right. Okay? That's a perfect list of rules that reflects the character of God. So here in the New Testament, in Galatians 3.21, it says, if it could come by keeping a list of rules, we already had the perfect list of rules. It would have come by that list. Mm-hmm. So think about the folly of now people coming along and saying, hey, we're no longer under that law, but let's create a new list. Hmm. <laughs> what, we got a new improved list? And, and, and the New Testament would insist absolutely not. In fact, in that same book, Galatians, that was Galatians 3.21 that I, that I quoted. Galatians 2.21 says that if righteousness could be gained through the law again, Mm -hmm. this perfect list, the best one anybody could come up with. Now get this part, Christ died for nothing. Mm -hmm. So Paul, who wrote Galatians, is reasoning the same way that I mentioned a bit ago. Hey, if we've got the ability to do this on our own, then it's a matter of give me the list and and, and have at it. And that's what he's saying there, and you wouldn't need Christ to die. But of course, Christ did die. And the fact that he died then indicates that the whole rules list idea, whether it's perfect one that God gave or some other one that you might formulate isn't going to get it done. So if you don't get sin right, you're never going to get the gospel mm-hmm. right. Now you said then we cannot, and use the word atone. Yeah, I, that's, I was just thinking about that. As you said that, I was thinking uh, all that you just described there is because God is gracious, because you said, just give me the list. You know, if it's about what I do, just give me yeah. the list and I'll go yeah. to town. Uh, we 
take the list and then we'd immediately ruin it for ourselves. <laughs> exactly. And he knows we can't yeah, keep the list. Yeah. And he's already seen that demonstrated over centuries. Yeah. Right. So now we need some we need something yeah, different. And just just to not to put too fine a point on it, uh, God wasn't curious if it could be done or not. Right? Did. right. He he did that to show us. Indeed. That's why the Bible yes. calls the law the schoolmaster to lead us to In Christ. In that same book of Galatians, yeah. Galatians chapter three. Exactly yeah. right. Now you use the word atone, that, mm -hmm. that we cannot atone for our sin. And you're exactly right. It's beyond us. We're sinful, so that word's another one of these biblical terms that supports that summary that I gave. Yeah. Uh, we're sinful, so our atonement, covering mm -hmm. of our sin, paying for our sin, would be tainted yeah. because we're, we're sinful. So if we're trying to atone on our own, then any atonement we would try to make is going to be tainted by the sin we, we all are born with. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know, as we've already said, what all it is I'm supposed to pay anyway. Mm -hmm. So how many hoops am I going to need to jump through in order to make this atonement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first, In the first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, there's the Day of Atonement, right? right? In which the high priest just one, one time each year could go into this most holy place mm -hmm. Uh, of the temple, and he would sprinkle the blood of an innocent animal to atone for the sins of the nation. And this was all preceded by uh, just all year long, thousands of animal sacrifices to cover sin. But as as we've said, the number of sins are just too numerous. And, and animals, the Bible says animals uh, can never be a sufficient substitute for the sins of humans. So the New Testament says, for example, in mm. Hebrews 10.4, that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Right. Jesus is called uh, in the New Testament the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? So, so yes, getting the problem right allows you to then get the solution right. Mm -hmm. In your summary, you said uh, of the gospel, you said it's a gift that we receive, mm -hmm. not something we do uh, to earn it. Yeah, so we're sinners. Sin is as black as we've described here, as yeah. more importantly, the way the Bible describes it. Therefore, what are we going to do to earn it? Mm -hmm. That's not going to be tainted in some way. So getting sin wrong by minimizing it in some way so that we can count it or God somehow overlooks it means that we can devise ways to atone by what we do. And this is the reason so much religion is really works religion, because mm -hmm. it fails to see the enormity of sin. That only the perfect sacrifice given by God himself and in God himself can, in fact, pay for it. And nothing sinful people can do is going to earn it. And that's why you have this famous passage in Ephesians chapter 2, the passage that God used in my life to, bring, to turn the light on, mm -hmm. to bring me to Christ. When I say turn the light on, at age 19, in my bedroom, reading the Bible, grown up in church, grew up in church, memorized large portions of the Bible, went to a Christian school in junior high and senior high, Bible class, you know, so a lot of Bible knowledge, but very confused about this idea that I could lose my salvation and, you know, how, how is it on me? Mm -hmm. And so I'm in my bedroom and I'm reading the book of Ephesians and God's good providence. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And it says, and this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, mm -hmm. so that no one can boast. And I say the light went on. That's actually biblical terminology, the light going on, <laughs> yeah. illumination. Yeah, absolutely. You're being you, the Holy Spirit turns the light on of the Word of God so that what were words before are now powerful, spiritually mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. in the heart of the person on whom the Spirit of God wasn't, works. Wasn't that you'd never heard those words it wasn't that you didn't understand the denotative meaning, that's meaning right, that's but right. the application to your life, the Holy Spirit no, made right and it was And life-changing, literally yeah, life-changing. Yeah. So, oh, wait a minute, it's, it's His grace, mm. and it's not by what I do, and it's by faith, and it's a gift, and all of that in that, those marvelous two verses. So we can define now a couple more important Bible words related to the gospel, grace. It's undeserved. It's unearned favor from God. But that passage in Ephesians 2 says, It is by grace you have been saved. 
And if listeners are familiar with church and you're familiar with Christian lingo, you'll know that sometimes people will say, when did you get saved? Or like I said, I got saved when I was at age 19 in my bedroom. Uh, So here, Ephesians chapter 2 is using that. It is by grace you have been saved. Well, what does that mean? Grace is this undeserved, unearned favor from God. Saved means to be rescued, Mm -hmm. to be delivered. Salvation. Well, what are we rescued from? What are we delivered from? We're delivered from, one, the wrath of God toward our sin. This holy God, absolutely holy God, is going to deal with sin, must deal with sin, as a matter of Mm -hmm. fact, and he is angry at, at sin. The wrath of God abides upon those who are outside of Christ, who all humanity has, in effect, shaken its fist mm-hmm. uh, before, before God. So we're delivered from the wrath of God. And then the Bible says we're also delivered from some other things. We're delivered, saved, rescued from the power of sin. Mm-hmm. We can now live for God. We can now please God in our Christian walk after we come to, to Christ because he does something in us that we'll talk about in in a little bit. And then ultimately, we're going to be saved from, rescued, delivered from the very presence of sin Mm. when when Jesus returns. So you've got grace, that's that undeserved, unearned favor from God. Saved, we're rescued, we're delivered from the wrath of God, from the power of sin in the future, from the presence of sin. And then it is by faith, Mm. that, that verse says, And I have said many, many, many times to our congregation that the same Greek word in your New Testament that's translated faith is also belief. Mm -hmm. So faith, when you see faith, it's believing. Mm -hmm. So it is by grace you have been saved through believing, Mm -hmm. through through Mm -hmm. faith. We receive what Christ has done for Mm -hmm. us by believing, not by doing. Yeah, I just, uh, I've found it helpful over the years in thinking of that to uh, remember as well that the same concept is uh, can be referred to as trust. It's mm-hmm. it's not just mere mental assent. You know, the Bible says True. that the demons believe the yeah, facts of what we're talking True. about and they shudder because of it. Um, but it's putting our trust. So when when I'm talking about well, what would make me accepted by God? Mm. I'm putting my confidence, my trust in what Jesus did. Amen. That's what we mean by putting my faith in it, belief Very in good. it. Very good. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So when we receive the gift of salvation because of Jesus' life and death for us, and that's that's so important that you emphasize mm-hmm. that, uh, that it's not just his death but his righteous life, then we begin to do what he wants. Wow. We don't work for our salvation. That's not what we're saying here. In fact, we can't, like we highlighted. Right. Uh, but once we're saved, we do begin to live differently, mm-hmm. not in order to earn something, not to earn God's favor right. the, or salvation rescuing that you talked about, mm-hmm. but because we've been given that salvation. So out of gratitude yes. then, out of thankfulness to the Lord, and that's why you've got Romans, for example, in this important transition in chapter 12, verse mm-hmm. 1, mm-hmm. says, Therefore I urge you, brothers in, and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Mm. This is your true and proper worship. And that word, therefore, at the beginning of that verse is important because it points back to all of the first 11 chapters and what Paul had said there about what Christ has done for us. And then he says, therefore, this is how we should respond. Yes, exactly. And we're now able to respond Mm -hmm. with lives Mm -hmm. of gratitude because not only has God done things then when we believe, trust, receive Mm -hmm. what Christ has done. He's not only done things, now hear this, everybody, not only done things outside of us uh, when we receive his gift, but he's also made a change inside of Mm -hmm. us. And there are terms for those, those things that happen external to us and those that happen internal to us when we come to, to Christ. When, when we receive the gift of salvation offered in the person and, and work of Christ, here are a couple of other Bible terms that describe what happens then. Uh, the first, let me deal with a couple that uh, deal with what happens external to us, outside of us. One is justification. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Romans chapter 4 uses this term, justification, and it's a courtroom term, and it envisions a, a judge who's declaring guilt or, or innocence. And God is the judge in this case, and justification is God the righteous judge declaring Mm -hmm. us, the guilty Mm -hmm. sinner, righteous, even though we're not 
personally righteous. It's this perfect life that Jesus mm-hmm. had lived. That's then, the Bible uses this term, imputed, counted to us, so that he declares us righteous, not on the basis of our life and the righteousness that we don't actually have, but mm-hmm. the righteousness that Christ has and is like, given to us. Almost like an accounting term, right? It's like it goes from Jesus' column to our column. There you go. Yeah. It is an accounting term. That's mm-hmm. exactly right. And that is why then the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus go together in our salvation, mm-hmm. because it is that perfect life of righteousness that then the Father, God the Father saw in God the Son, and then approved, because it was absolutely perfect, And the Bible says then in Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, he was raised for our justification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He he was raised, meaning an approval of the entire righteous life. And because of that, now we have access to this perfect righteousness Mm -hmm. of Jesus. What a beautiful thing. But that's something that happens external to us. That's something that God says he now has done and he sees us that way. It's a beautiful promise. But there's nothing emotional or experiential, Mm -hmm. internal that happens to you. Another of these external wonderful things that happens in the the salvation event when we come to Christ is adoption. So we are now who were estranged. We use that word at the very beginning of this. Mm -hmm. Sin has us estranged from God. Now we're not only not estranged, we're brought into his family. And we're given the full rights of sons and, and daughters. Of, of inheritance. We are the Bible. It's just mind-blowing that the Bible talks about us being co-heirs mm-hmm. with, with Christ and brothers and sisters with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. So those are external things, but there are changes that happen internally too. Because when we come to Christ for salvation, we are, a couple more terms, born again. Mm-hmm. It's a Bible term. Remember John chapter 3, Jesus talks to this Jewish religious leader, Nicodemus, and Jesus says to him, you must be born again, and you will not see the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. So born again, uh, another theological term that means the same thing is regenerated. And it means this, born again, yes, means you've got to be born a second time because there was something that was wrong the first time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That something that was wrong the first time is what we said earlier, you come into the world with a sin nature, Mm -hmm. all of us do. So you have to be born a second time, but it's literally born from above, that you have a spiritual life now given to you that you didn't have when you you came into the world. And that's what regenerated means, imparting spiritual life. And we know, we now then have the power to do now, Mm -hmm. after we come to Christ, because we've been born again, because we've had this internal change, now we can do what before we could not. Yeah. Well, that brings us to the question that we started with, yeah. then, how do I know I'm a Christian? Mm-hmm. Especially, you know, in light of all we've said here, the change that happens, uh, change, part of it you don't feel, part of it's just uh, God tells us this is what I do. Part right. of it, though, is a difference that should be visible. Yes. And so, uh, you know, someone may be wondering, how do I know I'm a Christian, especially if I'm not displaying a changed life, mm-hmm. that I'm born again, that I'm yeah. regenerated? Well, this is the matter of assurance of salvation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and first, for our assurance, we should go to the promises of God. What does God say about how we can have a relationship with Him? Let's remind ourselves of that like we've rehearsed here. And so I would encourage you, if you're struggling with this issue of assurance, first to go there. Mm-hmm. Who is Jesus? What did Jesus do? He is the one who lived the life that we were supposed to live. He's the one who died the death we deserve. He offers both of those to us, and that life and that death do all of the things that we've talked about here. Mm-hmm. So remind yourself of that. It's the promises of God. But salvation is not proven by a birth certificate in the past. Mm-hmm. but rather by a changed life in the present. Mm-hmm. So don't simply say, hey, you know, there was that time when I was eight years old and I remember praying and asking Jesus, but nothing's happened mm-hmm. in my life. If nothing's happened in my life, that means, hey, there wasn't that born again thing. Mm-hmm. There wasn't that impartation of spiritual life. Now, there's a, a book in your Bible that deals with this issue of assurance and the grounds of that assurance. It's First John. First John has five chapters to it. And in the last chapter, chapter 5, the very last verse of the body of that letter is verse 13. 
1 John 5, 13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. We're mm -hmm. talking about assurance here. Mm -hmm. So that you may know that you have eternal life. And that's really the end of the book. I've written <laughs> this letter to you, says John, for that reason, so that you can have assurance that you really do have eternal life. Now, you've probably, you, you've probably experienced this, but, but maybe not. I certainly have. When I was taught to evangelize, give the gospel, early on in my Christian life, one of the things I was taught to do was show people in the Bible where it says, you know, show them where it says they're a sinner, show them where it says Christ died for you, and you know, all of that and then urge them to receive him. That's all good. But then once they pray the prayer, immediately go to 1 John 5, 13 and mm -hmm. say, okay, you have this assurance of salvation. Mm -hmm. These things in the Bible are written so that you'll know that. Well, that's really not what 1 John 5, 13 is doing. Mm -hmm. 1 John 5, 13 is talking to people who have been saved for a while yeah, and who, who believe. And now are the marks of a Christian present yeah. in your life? That's yeah. what it's saying. And so in the verses prior to that final verse, it gives three of them. It gives mm -hmm. three tests of genuine yeah. salvation. Let me go through those quickly, yeah. okay? Yeah. There's a doctrinal test that a person who's truly a child of God, um, truly saved, have a relationship with God, is someone who believes the truth. They believe the Bible without reservation with regard to, to what God says. doesn't mean you never have any questions that need to be cleared up or any of that, but your inclination spiritually is to believe what God has said. And in chapter 4, for example, uh, it says this uh, in verse 2, that every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, what does that have to do with believing you know, doctrinal truth? Well, it's truth about Jesus, and it's saying, that's one example of truth about Jesus, that we have to believe that he, God, came as man. He came in the flesh. And part of the reason that was a big deal when John wrote that is because there was a, a false teaching, a heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism said that the physical body, the flesh, is evil. And therefore, God could never have inhabited a body. Mm -hmm. So it denied that God had actually come. And John is saying, hey, if you deny the truth that the Word of God teaches, then you're not a, you're not a true Christian. Mm -hmm. All right, that's the first one, doctrinal test. But then there's a sometimes called a social test. 1 John chapter 4 says, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Everyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So that's the social test. You know, do I have love for my brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons that the New Testament puts such emphasis on gathering. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we foster this love. That's how I know how to love you better. Because I know you. Mm -hmm. I know you better. And it has, the New Testament does all of these one another's in it. So you've got a doctrinal test. You've got a social test. Do I love God's people? And I would say to you, friend, if you find yourself listening to this and you say, you know, I... Uh, I, I'm hit and miss on going to church. I can take it or leave it. When I do attend, I don't really get to know anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not demonstrating the love of God for his people. That should be a sign of the changed life. But you can begin to demonstrate that. And we'll talk about starting anew in just a bit. Mm -hmm. So there's a doctrinal test. There's a social test. The third one is the moral test. And in 1 John chapter 2, uh, in verse 4, it says, uh, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Hmm. Okay, so uh, that last one can create some real doubt hmm. uh, for all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you're, you're a pastor, I'm a pastor, and it can, when you think about that, live as Jesus did, oh boy. Uh, you know, none of us does that perfectly. Correct. So how can I know I'm a Christian since I still sin after I come to Christ? Well, great question. And the good news is, First John anticipated that. <laughs> and right at the beginning, right at the very first chapter, mm -hmm. you know, deals with that very issue. First uh, John chapter 1 in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not mm -hmm. in us. But then goes on to say that if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. so we all have them, but we confess our sins. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive us our sins, purify us from all unrighteousness. So here's what it means then. It's not that 
to walk as Jesus did means you'll never sin. Mm -hmm. Of course, this side of heaven and even after salvation, we still struggle with the sin nature and we all still sin. And if we say otherwise, we lie, right. says, says John. So we've all got that issue. So the difference between a true believer and an unbeliever, and hear me carefully then, the difference between a true believer and a non-believer, someone who's really a Christian and someone who is not, it's not the presence or absence of sin. Mm -hmm. Because both of us have that. Yeah. The true Christian still has sin. The non-believer still has sin. It's not the presence or absence of sin, it's the reaction to it. Mm. You know that you're a Christian because you don't want it. Mm -hmm. You want to rid yourself of it. You have it, 1 John 1, 8, but then there's the next verse. The Christian reacts to it by saying, Lord, rid me of this. Mm -hmm. I want to live righteously. Forgive me. We confess, we confess our sin. And that's the Holy Spirit, the one who gave you, imparted that new life. You're born again. You've been regenerated. And that's the Holy Spirit convicting you of your sin. And if you have that, then, if you find yourself saying, I know I'm not where I should be, and it's given me doubt about whether or not I've been a child of God, and so I listen to this, you know, this episode for that very reason. But if you care about this, it's a great sign. Mm -hmm. It's a great sign that God's at work in your life and that God in his goodness to you uh, had you stumble across this podcast for you to hear about this topic and to be refreshed on what the gospel is and the fundamentals of that. But then as it comes down to application in your life, then... Uh, I can confess and I can say, Lord, I know I've wandered from you and I know I've not pleased you in these areas and I, I, I forsake that. I want you more than I want that. Forgive mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And then you move ahead for the Lord. If you were convicted by some of the things I said about those three tests, the doctrinal test or the social test, yeah, you know, I'm kind of taking it or leaving it on church. Okay, confess that mm -hmm. and, and say, Lord, help me now to be faithful to you, being faithful to your people, and he will, he will do that, and he will restore your path. Amen. Well, I just want to uh, reiterate a couple things you said. Um, if you would like to know more about the gospel, trusting Christ as your Savior, you want to get in touch with us, you have specific questions, you can always get in contact with us by emailing info at cbctrenton.com. Uh, likewise, you can go to our website, cbctrenton.com, and use our connection form there to reach out to us. Um, we've got a link in the description below to the bridge for further explanation of the gospel if you need mm -hmm. that. And certainly, if hearing this message, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, mm -hmm. we want to help you. Um, so do reach out yes. to us in one of those ways. Let us know, even if you're not in our area and we can't help you by having you come and, and serving you personally, we can help you find a, a Bible-believing church in your area. So we hope this has been helpful to you. We're, we're glad that you're able to tune in and watch this episode today. Uh, as I always do, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel if you don't already. Hit the notification bell so you know when new episodes come out. We try to release a new episode every Saturday at 2 p.m. And we look forward to seeing you in the next one. If you have a question you'd like us to consider, you can send that into our email address, info at cbctrenton.com, or text it to us at 97000.